Uh, good morning and welcome once again to World Affairs. On this occasion, the uh, 119th birthday of an old favorite, Lawrence Welk. Turn off the bubble machine. I'm sure you all recall that. Uh, we have something more important than Lawrence Welk to talk about today. And I can't imagine having a more time, timely topic uh, than the uh, Russia-Ukraine relationship. Um, our speaker today, of course, is Jeff Jones, an associate professor at UNCG in the history department, <clears throat> where he specializes generally in contemporary world history and specifically in the, in the Russian Soviet realm. Um, we're doing something a little bit unique today. Uh, Jeff had uh, committed to give this talk to another group at, in Greensboro. Um, and we agreed to allow those folks to come on and we welcome you. Uh, however, uh, resident, uh, excuse me, Meadows residents should know that uh, the group in Greensboro will not be participating in the chat room aspect uh, Q&A following uh, Jeff's talk. So without more, Jeff, take it away. Okay, thanks, Bob, uh, for the introduction and for organizing uh, this event. Uh, thanks also, by the way, to Marty Lyon, who's sort of the behind the scenes wizard making all the technology stuff happen. Uh, and I'll tell you, when Bob organized uh, or invited me to speak back in, the, back in the fall, we really had no idea where we would be at the time. In fact, our initial topic was sort of to be announced, but alas, here we are. Uh, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict in a uh, historical context. And specifically what I'd like to do today is kind of give some of the background, deep history of Ukraine, uh, Russia and relations, and relatively briefly, then look at the NATO and the legacy of the Cold War and its role in the current conflict. And then finally wrap up with the current conflict, at least the roots of it from 2013 to today, and use that as sort of a jumping off point then for the Q&A that will go with uh, from there. Uh, Russia, of course, if we look at the two key players here, as I'm sure you all know, by far the world's largest country covers one sixth of the Earth's land mass, population of a roughly 144, 145 million uh, with a great deal of ethnic diversity. Uh, they're about 80% of the population are ethnic Russians and that Russian is their native language, but it's a very mixed country, of course. Ukraine here, we see it uh, over in here, to, obviously, to the sort of south uh, west of Russia right in here. Notice, by the way, the capital Kiev with here rendered, and I had to look for a map, by the way, with this, <laughs> this in its Ukrainian spelling, K-I-E-V, Kiev, the, the Ukrainian pr pronunciation. Ukraine is uh, slightly smaller than Texas. It is the second largest, second to Russia, that is, country in Europe, has a population of about 46 million. Not surprisingly, of course, the vast majority of the population are ethnic Ukrainians, about 78% in that Ukrainian is their native language. Again, Russians make up the largest minority group at about 17% and are disproportionately concentrated in the east and in particular the southeastern region over in here uh, for reasons that I want to come back to and clarify for historical reasons that we'll talk about. Ukraine is shaped by its location. Most countries are geographically, that is, uh, shaped by their geography to a significant degree. For one thing, it's very flat. It's part of the vast Eurasian plain that stretches all the way from uh, Central Asia to, to Poland. And it's it's caught between. Ukraine is, is located between historically more powerful neighbors, which is always a dangerous scenario. The name Ukraine comes from the Slavic word that sort of variously translates as borderland or frontier region, right? And of course, like the other republics of the former Soviet Union, UK, Ukraine received its uh, independence at the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, so it's been independent now for 30, 30 plus, 31 years. The history here is very important. I and mean, in fact, history has itself become somewhat of a battleground. And Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, has done a great deal himself to sort of historicize this conflict by claiming, as he did uh, 
in this sort of maniacal, frankly, rambling speech that he gave a couple of days prior to invading Ukraine, that there is no such thing historically as Ukraine, he claimed. It's all just been part of Russia. And that is a claim that I want to start with and debunk at the outset because that is patently false on the face of it. And the logical starting point for that discussion, I'm not sure what folks are seeing, let me minimize the image here. Uh, uh, the, the logical starting point is the ancient medieval kingdom of the Kievan Rus. And now here you see Kiev and the cursor there in its Russian spelling, which you'll find still most commonly Kiev as opposed to Kiev, the Ukrainian spelling. And both Ukraine and Russia claim this medieval empire that thrived from roughly the 9th through the 13th century as the starting point for their respective histories. And again, history is part of this, very much a part of this conflict, to put it mildly. And they all, they both, I think correctly, they can both certainly make claims to Kiev or Kiev as, a, as the beginning point of their respective histories. But it's at that point really that their histories diverge to a significant degree. We can very clearly mark the end of the Kievan Rus Empire at 1240, which was when the Mongol invaders uh, came, swept through the region and, and basically took over, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, conquered and, and uh, took over, occupied Kievan Rus, uh, Kievan Rus uh, during, during this long stretch of a couple of centuries or so. And in the period thereafter, most of what is today Ukraine, you see it sort of, tra sort of transposed on the map here, became part of a vast <laughs> commonwealth, the Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth beginning in really the 15th century uh, to, well, piece by piece, it, what we see it here is that the height is really a little bit later than that, more like the 16th, early 17th century. At its high, territorial height, which we don't quite see here, the P Polish um, Lithuanian Commonwealth stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north all the way down here to the Black Sea in the south. So it was quite vast, to put it mildly. It encompassed pretty much the vast majority, at least, of modern Ukraine. And I think a key point in this is that it was to the west of what is eventually going to become Russia. After the uh, collapse of Kievan Rus and the invasion and con uh, conquest and occupation by the Mongols, what is going to become Russia and the Russian Empire begins to develop around the then small city of uh, Moscow or Muscovy, as it was known in its ancient uh, times, in the ancient times. It's located you know, roughly around in here to the west of what is now the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that's where the histories really diverge and go on very different paths. And they're going to remain on different paths for, for quite some time, but eventually they do kind of come back together for sure. Beginning in 1654, the middle of the 17th century, Ukraine, six years prior, by the way, had, had broken away from Poland, but again, finds itself caught between these more powerful neighbors, the Polish, what's left, the remnants of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at that time to its sort of north, northeast, and to its uh, north, northwest, excuse me, and then to its east, the emerging increasingly more powerful empire based in Moscow, Muscovy, the Russian empire, that is, and Ukraine here very much in the middle, and in fact, is at this point seeking sort of Russian protection. They sign a treaty of protection with Moscow at this time. Protection from Poland, by the way, is sort of implied in that. And this is the beginning of the, what you might call Ukraine's absorption into Russia's sphere of control. I think a very significant side note to this is worth mentioning here as well, which is that we know that at the signing of this treaty, there were translators present because uh, you, the, the languages are quite different. Ukrainian is a different language from Russian, and I think that's worth uh, worth underscoring here. Uh, I, I saw that myself, by the way. In, I'm fluent in Russian from having lived there sometime in the in the 90s and since, off and on visiting there. And uh, for the first time in any significant degree, I was in Ukraine in 2015 for about two months doing uh, research on a current uh, project there, and you know the languages were very different, I have to say. And this was somewhat against my expectations. I had been told by many Russians over the years and Russian linguists, by the way, who have claimed that 
oh, Ukrainian is just a dialect of Russian. It's, it's so closely rooted. It's not really a separate language. It's just a dialect. And that's not the case. Ukrainian is definitely a separate language from Russian. And I think that's worth emphasizing again, because that speaks to a key point here of national identity, ethnic national identity. Ukraine is separate from Russia culturally, linguistically, historically. Of course, they're closely related. Ukrainian language and Russian languages are definitely both closely related Slavic languages, but the, there are also very key differences. And that, that's sort of the key theme I want to get across here, which is they are they're culturally, historically, and linguistically similar, tied, linked, without a doubt, but there are also cultural, historical, and linguistic differences between Ukraine and Russia that bear uh, emphasis here. As we fast forward uh, through the chronology here, by the end of the 18th century, the reign of uh, Catherine the Great, Ukraine, and by that point, really most of Eastern Poland as well, had been pretty much completely absorbed into the now very much vastly expanding Russian empire. As you can see on this map, a lot of it to the east, where there's not a whole lot going on there. But if we concentrate here on, on European Russia, the part of uh, uh, Europe, the part of the empire that we're talking about focusing on, Kiev, as we see here again in its Russian spelling, is basically under Russian control by the middle of the uh, uh, 17th century. Then you see Warsaw over here with the partitions under the Catherine, Catherine the Great. Warsaw itself falls under the Prussian Empire, but much of Eastern Poland falls under Russian control by the end of, of Catherine's reign. This is why many Poles, by the way, to this day hate Catherine. Uh, and so much of current Ukraine then is under the Russian empire from basically the 17th century on, mid, mid 17th century on with, with sort of variations, not all of it though. And I, again, we look at the map here, the borders transposed of modern Ukraine, you see the outer borders there shaded. A huge chunk of this westernmost part of what is today Ukraine was never part of the Russian empire and was in fact not absorbed into Ukraine as its current Currently, current borders until after World War II, it was instead historically part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as you see here, right up until the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of World War I, and then it was divvied up at uh, Versailles, and it's not until after World War II that that area becomes absorbed as part of, of Ukraine. So that part of Ukraine in particular is extremely different from Russia historically, linguistically, and, and otherwise culturally as well. So Ukraine linked to Russia, but different from Russia, right? Uh, the Ukraine experienced a brief period of independence during the Civil War period, 1918 to 1921. But the Soviet Red Army, based, of course, in Moscow, defeated its opponents there and reabsorbed uh, what is today Ukraine, Ukraine by, uh, under Moscow's control by, uh, 19, uh, by 1921, by the end of the Civil War. And I, I point this out because in that speech that uh, Putin gave a couple of days before he invaded the recent invasion of Ukraine, he gave an extremely distorted history lesson, <laughs> I have to say, and it, it's worthy of, uh, you know, rebuttal. rebuttal. <laughs> Putin said uh, that uh, this was the point at which Ukraine was created. He used, he used that term, by the way, that the early Soviet leaders, namely Lenin and Stalin, he said, created Ukraine in the early Soviet period by making it a sep separate rep republic within the now emergent Soviet Union and encouraging Ukrainians to uh, promote their own linguistic and cultural uh, identities. By the way, they did this in the, in the early Soviet period. They did this throughout the Soviet Union, all the Soviet republics, not just Ukraine. I mean, he's right about that. But his notion that this somehow created Ukraine is patently absurd. <laughs> uh, they did this, the early Soviet leaders, Putin claimed to placate those within Ukraine who had, who were still clamoring for independence after that brief period, that window of 1918 to 21 in which they were independent. Many Ukrainians were still clamoring for independence. And so According to Putin's version of history, this is the, the early Soviet leaders created Ukraine to placate those folks, when of course the exact opposite is really true. Uh, they 
they gave a relative degree of cultural and linguistic autonomy to Ukrainians in order to essentially uh, bring the Ukrainians into the Soviet system without too much opposition. They did not create it by any means. They were, on the contrary, acknowledging the existence of a strong strain of Ukrainian nationalism, which, which bears emphasis here, to put it mildly. So as we move into the Soviet era, it's, there's going to be, of course, a few very crucial, profound events uh, here with Ukraine, none more so than the Holodomor, as it's called, uh, loosely translates in Ukrainian to the terrible time of famine, uh, terrible time of hunger, that is. It's a devastating famine in the early 1930s during the rule of Soviet leader Joseph Stalin in response to or as a result of his campaign to collectivize agriculture, that is to create uh, large state-owned farms and there was tremendous opposition to this policy within Ukraine, probably because it has by far the best agricultural land, by the way, in the, in the former Soviet Union, in the former Russian Empire, for that matter. Ukraine was the breadbasket, first of the Russian Empire and then subsequently of, of the Soviet Union. So it had by far the best land, which is why uh, Ukrainian peasants did not want to give it up to these their state-owned collectivized farms. There was a great deal of opposition to collectivization, not just in Ukraine, mind you, that was a common theme throughout the uh, Russian Soviet Union and elsewhere as well, opposition to collectivization, but it was particularly staunch in Ukraine. So a lot of Ukrainians to this day, this is an extremely controversial topic, I, might, I must uh, add here. A lot of debate on the famine of the of the early 30s, but we look at the map here. It was devastating, in particular for Ukraine. The famine, 25 percent, the darker red areas, 25 percent or more decline in population as a result of the famine. And you see some areas are particularly hard hit, and those are mostly Ukraine. That's mostly Ukraine. It's not not entirely Ukraine. For example, here's Rostov the city that I studied in my dissertation years ago and lived in off and on. This is in Southern Russia. I lived there for about two years off and on. Over the years, Krasnodar, which is also very severely uh, hit from the famine down here as well. That's it, all of this is in Russia. So it was certainly hit by the famine as well. But you see the impact of the famine in particular and how hard, here's Kiev again, how harsh it is, 25% uh, or more in these darker red areas in the former, in, in Ukraine, in the Ukraine. And uh, I wanted to highlight it also while we got this map up, this area of Luhansk and also Donetsk. Donetsk was less severely hit. This is a coal rich region of the Ukraine. And so the idea being that the, uh, uh, it was relatively well supplied with, with food because they wanted the workers to be able to mine the coal. But in the aftermath of the famine, sort of adding um, insult to injury, so one estimated four to five million deaths, uh, that, that number is far from clear, by the way. Uh, to make matters worse, add insult to injury, Stalin afterwards settled a disproportionate number of Russians into these lands, especially in that southeastern corner of Luhansk, as well as Donetsk, the coal-rich region that was so vital, in fact, to the energy as well as national defense for, because of the coal. And they settled them into these lands that were vacated by famine victims, victims to a significant degree under these newly collectivized farms. So that is, I think, a an important historical point for explaining why that area is disproportionately Russian speaking ethnic Russian. That area of Ukraine is disproportionately ethnic Russian to this day. And I will add as well, again, tremendous debates with regard to uh, the, uh, the cause of the famine, but Ukrainian nationalists of which there are still a large, large number to put it mildly, saw it at the time and have seen it since as a man-made, as an engineered famine, that Stalin did it specifically to punish Ukrainians for their opposition to his policy of collectivization. And this has been not only a defining event among Ukrainians, but a rallying point in terms of Ukrainian nationalism ever since.
Not long thereafter, of course, uh, roughly a decade later, we get the outbreak of uh, World War II, and Ukraine once again finds itself caught in the middle between two powerful neighbors, Nazi Germany on the one side, Soviet uh, Russia on the other side. Of course, it was still Ukraine part of the Soviet Union at the time. In June 1941, uh, uh, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union and occupied most of Ukraine within weeks. In Ukraine, as elsewhere, Ukrainians responded variously to these uh, to these events. Some, without a doubt, supported the Germans, hoping to gain independence uh, and also to end collectivization, which remains sort of the mo most despised aspect of Soviet policy for sure. Many, however, fought against the Germans. The estimate is about 7 million Ukrainians fought as soldiers in the Soviet Red Army, as regular soldiers. An untold number as well fought as partisans against the Nazis as, as well. Uh, so there were, you know, it's not as if, and this has been floated, this is part of, I think, the distortion campaign with regard to the history of Ukraine, that they're, oh, they were all just Nazi collaborators during World War II. There certainly were some, without a doubt, uh, but not all by any stretch of the imagination and a majority, I would say, by the end of the war, especially when it became clear that actually Germany had its own <laughs> agenda, was not going to grant independence, was not going to end up collectivization, which it did not in the areas that it occupied. It became pretty clear pretty uh, fast to the Ukrainians that this was not to their benefit either. So actually many then fought with and for, formed and fought with nationalist militias, Ukrainian nationalist militias who fought against both the Nazis and the Soviet Red Army and indeed continued for some time after the war into the early 50s, around 52 or so. Um, some of these Ukrainian nationalist militias are, are still fighting against the Soviets into the early 1950s. Unfortunately, there's also a clear history here of massacres against local Poles by some of these militias, the Ukrainian nationalist militias, and Jews as well. This was not a pretty chapter in the history of Ukraine, but alas, this was not a pretty his chapter in the history of anyone, right? Anywhere else, right? World War II was horrendous for all. And yes, anti-Semitism runs strongly, unfortunately, throughout the history of Ukraine. I saw a bit of it when I was there. There were a uh, uh, group called the Right Sector that's still very active for sure in Ukraine. And they had set up a table at one point in the main square, Maidan, and then walking around there one Saturday, I happened to encounter these guys and just kind of stayed back and listened to, they were speaking in Russian, interestingly, <laughs> and listened to uh, some of their uh, anti-Semitic nonsense, right? I mean, they're there, they're there for sure. But guess what? Anti-Semitism runs strong throughout the history of Russia, Poland, Germany, France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not unique to Ukraine by any stretch of the imagination. And to somehow focus on that as Putin has done as part of the propaganda campaign behind this war, behind his justification for this war, to somehow call for the denazification of Ukraine's leadership, for example, is just patently absurd, especially when you consider that the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is partly Jewish. He is of Jewish background. What country dominated by anti-Semitism elects a Jew as a president, right? Yes, there is anti-Semitism in Ukraine, without a doubt. There is anti-Semitism in Russia. There is anti-Semitism in Poland. There is anti-Semitism across Europe and in many parts of the world and including in the United States. So it's there, no doubt. But to focus on that as a justification is ridiculous for what the Russians have done. So anyway, had to work that part in because I think that is an important part of the history as well as the distortion of the history that Putin has promoted here. Let me shift gears, though, as we're to the now end of the World War II era and the legacy of the Cold War, which brings us to NATO. And this is a, I will preface up front here, NATO is very much in the front and center, of course, of the current developments in ways that I'm not sure that all Americans are aware of or perhaps understand. And on this issue, I have to say up front, and I will concede perhaps somewhat controversially, I think that Putin has a bit of a point here. To put it bluntly, why does NATO, as a relic of the Cold War, still exist? I have been asking this question since the 90s, by the way, 
this is not a new issue for me at all. And, and I'm not alone. Many U.S. and European military leaders, as well as others, have, have likewise cited NATO's continued existence as a problem, especially for the Russians. So let's turn then to the Cold War legacy of NATO, which uh, was created in 1949, the early stages of the Cold War. It came out of the infamous blockade of West Berlin imposed by Stalin as trying to choke off, trying to bring all of Berlin under Soviet control in the fall of 48. It lasted for about six months, but the famous Allied uh, airlifts broke the blockade and uh, Stalin had to back down. And then after that, the Western leaders decided to form NATO as uh, basically a military alliance to, you know, meet the possible threat of a Soviet invasion of Europe. That's basically what NATO came from in 49. Six years later, the Soviets countered by creating their own defense alliance, the Warsaw Pact. And with that, we had very literally the Cold War divisions uh, set in, on the map for years to come. With the end of the Cold War, though, to fast forward to that point in the early 90s, of course, the Warsaw Pact disbanded, but NATO did not. NATO lived on, which irked many Russians, to put it mildly. At the time, I was living and doing a lot of my dissertation research in Russia in the early mid-90s, and this was, you know, even in the Yeltsin years, this was something that came up quite, uh, quite often. U.S. President Bill Clinton really repurposed NATO in the early 90s during the conflict in the Balkans for use essentially, essentially against Serbia, which further upset Russians because of its strong historical ties and alliance uh, with Serbia. Russians have always looked, even that's one of the main reasons for Russia's involvement in World War I, in fact, was its uh, uh, strong historical ties to, to Serb Serbia as a fellow Slavic East Orthodox Christian uh, nation. And really post-Soviet Russia has resented NATO's continued existence ever since, and especially as it expands into Eastern Europe and right into the borders, in fact, of post-Soviet Russia. We see here a fairly complicated map. I won't get into all the nitty gritty here, but look, the key day I think is 1999, which is the beginning of the post-Soviet expansion, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary enter at that time. Then you get uh, uh, Slovo uh, 2004, this shade here. That was a big step for not just for NATO, but in terms of now we're into the Putin era, of course, 2004, Putin takes over in 2000, and you get uh, the expansion of um, uh, NATO into uh, um, Slovakia here and Romania and the Baltic states. That particularly upset the Russians, right? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And, and then since, there's been subsequent uh, expansions as well. Croatia down here, part of the former Yugoslavia. Notice, uh, interestingly, this map is from 2018, so a few years now before this conflict. Intensified dialogue with Ukraine and with Georgia over here. The possibility of uh, uh, NATO expansion to Georgia was a key part of the Russian intervention in that country also in 2008 as well. So this is something that Russians see as a definite threat. Take a look here in another map comparing. First, you have the Cold War alignments that we've alluded to already, the blue being NATO, the whatever color that is being uh, Warsaw Pact. But now look at it as of 2015, and it's expanded even a little bit since then. Uh, Warsaw Pact is gone. <laughs> you have Russia and you have NATO encroaching upon Russia. This is something that Russians see as a threat. Quite frankly, they see it as a threat. Is, is it a threat? Well, I, I'm not sure. Honestly, NATO is a defense organization. That's worth emphasizing here. But if NATO is a defense organization for Europe and North America, against whom is it defending those countries, right? The obvious answer is Russia. And as a result, Russia, Russians have never really felt integrated in Europe into Europe since the Cold War's end. Uh, the only time, interesting, that Article 5, which is the main provision of NATO, <coughs> excuse me, calling uh, for if any member country is attacked by an outside party, all NATO members must come to its defense. The only time that that article has ever gone into effect was after 9-11 and Afghanistan. 
And so that's why that was a NATO uh, intervention into Afghanistan, not just a U.S. intervention. Obviously far from Europe, far from Russia, but yet NATO keeps encroaching closer and closer to Russia, infuriating Putin, I think giving him a sort of a whipping board, if you will, for his nationalistic base as they see uh, their country increasingly encircled by NATO. And Ukraine and Georgia really in particular seem to be where they have drawn the line with regard to the current conflict. Several observers before as well as since the invasion have publicly noted that taking the possibility of NATO expansion into Ukraine off the table may well have averted the invasion Yet no one seemed willing, neither the Ukrainian president Zelensky nor uh, U.S. President Biden, no one seemed willing to take that, to my mind, relatively basic and simple step. I think NATO, frankly, should have been, should have disbanded at the end of the Cold War, like the Warsaw Pact, which would have set a true, sent a true message of peace following decades of militarism, tensions, and hostility. But there is another point worth mentioning here, and I'm going to cite a number of scholars as well, William Hartung in particular, particular, who have written on this, a key reason for the continued existence and indeed expansion of NATO underlying factor. Every member state is required to meet a minimum of military preparedness, which means purchasing often high tech expensive weaponry, especially for new member states, because they have to bring their military up to that bare minimum of preparedness. And where do you think that most of those states purchase those weapons? Primarily, of course, from the United States, also increasingly from France, Italy, the UK, even a bit from Spain. So ultimately, NATO's continued existence and expansion is a major boon to the tune of billions of dollars to defense contractors right here in the United States, and thus ultimately to the military industrial complex of the US and these other key NATO members. Uh, I know my emeritus folks of, from uh, Greensboro have heard me harp on the Eisenhower speech <laughs> back at, as he was leaving the presidency in 1961. I still think wiser words have never been spoken and a warning that was not heeded, which is to be war, be weary of the military industrial complex. It has only grown to mammoth proportions ever since. And I think it's a key part of this, quite frankly, and a key part of the reason that we are in the mess that we are in. Let me emphasize and be clear, I do not see this as a justification at all for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And I'm not suggesting that it is or that there is a justification. I don't think that there is. Russia definitely, though, perceives NATO's expansion to its borders as a provocation. They have harped on it constantly since the 90s and especially since the 2000s under under Putin. So it leads us to, and I'll I'll end on this with regard to uh, NATO, kind of an ironic spot here, which is now the current conflict shows the possible need for NATO and an alliance to keep the threat of a Russian invasion at bay. But only because of the continued existence and expansion of NATO in the first place since the end of the Cold War that has gotten us to this precarious position. Let me then wrap up briefly with uh, the background of this conflict as events of eight, eight, nine years, eight, eight and a half years ago. The roots of the conflict, the current uh, conflict really dates back to November of 2013. I think some of you will recall Uh, At that time, uh, what turned out to be Ukraine's, at least to date, last pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, who had won a very close, but by all accounts, very fair. There were international observers all agree that it was a fair election. Yanukovych had won in 2010. And trouble started for him when he backed out of a trade deal that had been negotiated with the European Union in favor of a deal with Russia instead. That led to, at first, what were fairly small protests, but then those protests uh, grew in part because Yanukovych sent out the troops to put down that those protests, and that only made things matters worse because Seeing that, a lot more Ukrainians were very upset by the government's reaction to the protest as much as they were to the deal. Uh, And they came out in larger and larger and larger numbers. I think, again, a lot of you will remember those events, uh, defining events for Ukrainian history and the Maidan Square uh, 
back in uh, early 2014. Long story short, they ended with the overthrow of Yanukovych's government in February of 2014. Russia called it a coup d'etat orchestrated by the U.S. and the West. Uh, the, again, there's definitely some evidence to back that up. I would cite this is I was going to actually think about playing a bit of this, but I'll I instead just recommend that you, you, you take a look at this. It's on YouTube. I checked last night to make sure it was still on there. And it is infamous leaked phone call. It was supposed to be on a secure line, mind you, between uh, Victoria uh, Newland, who's on your left there, and the U U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, on your right there, obviously. Uh, she in D.C., him in Kiev, and they're on a supposedly a secure line. Turned out to be not very secure. I'm sure it was the Russians, although that's never been proven, <laughs> who, were, who were tapping the line. Uh, conversation's only about five minutes or so, but basically, they, this is in February, early February of 2014, while Yanukovych is still president, mind you, and they are discussing who is going to be in the next government of Ukraine. <laughs> and, and no, uh, you know, ifs, ands, or buts about it. They are calling the shots <laughs> of what will come. I, I recommend you do a quick uh, YouTube search on, you know, if you do her name, Newland and Pyatt and phone call, it will come up. Uh, basically, they're deciding, you know, the future of Ukraine. And this, of course, certainly fanned the flames of Russian uh, accusations that this was all orchestrated uh, from, from the West to some extent. There's no doubt that it was. Yanukovych was overthrown and uh, he was resp eventually replaced by a much too, well, now uh, Zelensky is now the second much more pro-Western uh, Ukrainian leader or president that has followed since. And uh, Putin back in 2014, again, you will recall, uh, responded by to these events that he saw as quite uh, negative for him as they were by invading, sending in Russian troops and taking over Crimea, which as you can see is this uh, peninsula, very strategic, very important to Russia. In fact, you see Sevastopol here, the city, it's a little, uh, uh, larger on this map. Sevastopol is an area that is home to the Russian Black Sea Fleet. And they had paid a yearly sort of rental fee to Ukraine to maintain the fleet there. So it's strategically extremely important to Russia and has been for quite some time. But um, now they no longer pay that annual fee because in 2014, they simply took it over. <laughs> Russian troops invaded. There is a slight Russian, it's about 58% of the population are Russian speaking majority there mixed with the uh, a Ukrainian minority, as well as a small minority of uh, Crimean Tatars, who are the indigenous people to Crimea. But they are now under, they have been since 2014 under direct Russian, Russian control. So that was part of Putin's reaction. And then finally, to wrap up here, the other part of his reaction to the events of 2014, which he obviously dis despised, to put it mildly, he began supporting uh, Russian-speaking separatist rebels in this area, in this area of the South Southeast. Again, that I highlighted in part for historical reasons, the aftermath of the famine being part of that, why, why there is a larger uh, Russian-speaking minor, uh, uh, majority in some parts of Luhansk and, and Donetsk, basically in these areas here. And they were, they've been supported by Putin since, since 2014 in a variety of ways, certainly weapons. There's a lot of reports of Russian volunteers going in and fighting as well with, uh, uh, against the Ukrainian government. There's been a low key kind of conflict there since 2014. The, US, the UN recently estimated that 14,000 people have died in that conflict since 2014. So I'm not sure how low key that, that, that is, right? And again, in that speech he gave just prior to his invasion, it was kind of in retrospect a telltale sign of where Putin was heading when he recognized the independence of these two broke, breakaway uh, republics, a clear sign that he was ramping up the, uh, the conflict. It was uh, therefore, by the way, a rejection of the Minsk Accords that had been signed back in 2014 that was basically kind of containing at least the conflict uh, at, at that point, although again, to reiterate, fighting had continued and been ongoing to varying degrees since this, uh, throughout this period. 
So I'm sure uh, to, to, to conclude here that uh, Putin and the Russians were expecting a quick and easy victory in this conflict. They expected to sweep into Kiev, remove the government. They've attempted to apparently assassinate uh, Zelensky unsuccessfully numerous times and replace the regime there with a pro, pro-Russian, anti-NATO uh, puppet government in effect. And the fact that, that now we're now over two weeks into this conflict and that has not happened uh, is, uh, is quite amazing, really. It speaks to the virility of the, the tremendous resistance of the Ukrainians and I think ultimately to the military failure of, of Russia in this case. Don't know where it's heading, of course, I think Putin is driven to, to carry that out regardless and tremendous cost of lives that we're seeing now. It's truly heartbreaking, but um, it will be interesting to see where things go from here. With that, I will wrap up and I'm happy to take any questions that you that anyone may have. Ah. Thank you, Jeff. You've really provided a wonderful perspective on what's happening these days. Um, and uh, you mentioned the uh, failure of the, of the uh, Russian military. I read this morning that several generals have been fired. I don't know if you, you noticed. Oh, that. yeah. No, actually, I have not seen any news this morning. <laughs> Is that several of the <laughs> Russian generals have been fired? Is that what you said? Yes, that's correct. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, that speaks uh, well, to military yeah. failure here, doesn't it? Uh, before I turn it over to the chat room, there's one thing I'd, I'd like to, one observation I'd like to make. Sure. I mean, for most of our lives, um, Ukraine was referred to as the Ukraine. Yeah, that's for true. That's true. Years, it's referred to simply as Ukraine. Right. As Jeff pointed out, uh, Ukraine is believed to, to basically mean borderlands. So the Ukraine and the borderlands, and the question is the borderlands of what? And of course, that's Russia. So Ukraine's identity was implicitly... Uh, uh, established in relation to Russia by called by removing the V and simply saying Ukraine, yeah. it se- severs that relationship in, in people's minds. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, let's look at the chat room. Let's see what we've got here. Only two at this point. I hope some more will jump in. I think First both are the same person, right? Pete Andrews. Very good question. I was mm-hmm. glimpsing at those. Good questions. Why would it be easy to have taken NATO membership from Ukraine off the table when the aspiration to join it is written into the Ukrainian constitution? Uh, do you want me to just stop there or add in the second one? Uh, let's go. They seem to both deal with NATO, so go ahead with the mm-hmm. second one as well. And it's the same. Really think uh, that if NATO had been disestablished in the 90s, Putin would have would not have sought to restore Russian control over Ukraine. How about the threat to the three independent Baltic countries in pursuit of the Russian aspiration to restore land linkage to its major naval base in Kaliningrad? There's a lot there. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, those are excellent questions. Very good questions. And yeah, maybe I'm overspeaking by saying it would have been easy. Although what I mean by that to take NATO uh, membership for Ukraine off of the table is, yes, you're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Andrews, that uh, Ukraine desperately has aspirations, has had aspirations for quite some time to join NATO for fairly obvious reasons, defense purposes of its own uh, part. But uh, the, uh, the other side of that, of course, you can't just join NATO because you want to. NATO has to invite you in, right? And indeed, there has been uh, talk of, NATO, of Ukraine, at least since the George Bush Jr., since the 2000s, George Bush Jr. Uh, era of Ukraine joining NATO. But there is a lot of opposition, especially Germany, to a lesser degree, France. The NATO members have to agree on ext- extending the membership, and they have not. And I don't think that they would anytime soon. Maybe they will now in the aftermath of whatever comes out of this mess, right? So that's a very good question. I think it would have been simply acknowledging reality. That's why I say relatively easy to take uh, Ukraine's NATO membership because it wasn't going to happen. It's not going to happen as long as there has been and still is, especially German and French opposition to that. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. 
Uh, do you really think uh, I good question? And I do recognize I'm in a little hot water on the Ukraine thing. It's impossible. First of all, Putin was not even in power in the 90s, by the way. He didn't come to power until 2000. And the independent Baltic states, that's where it's trickiest of all. I absolutely agree on that point, the Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and that's a two-edged sword because the membership, the addition to the membership of those countries to NATO, it particularly upset uh, Putin's Russia, to put it mildly, but it works both ways. And I see your point, uh, Mr. Andrews, which is, of course, that uh, uh, those countries have long lived with the threat of Russian domination and the threat of Russian invasion. Uh, I would say, though, and yes, you're right about the Kaliningrads, that little slither. I should have pointed that on some of those maps I brought up, the little slither of land that's not even conjoined to Russia. It's over to the east on the Baltic, and there is indeed a major naval base there. So you're absolutely right in all of these issues and questions. But I really think that taking NATO or disbanding NATO, now that doesn't mean we, the United States and other European powers could not have thus otherly made agreements and alliances with those Baltic states, for sure. But my point would be, if you're going to keep NATO, why not even at least, why not bring Russia into it, right? Especially, in, there were steps in that direction, by the way. In the 90s, uh, there were mi joint military exercises with Russian troops and NATO troops. I mean, that would have at least quelled some of the nationalist fears that Russia has seen with the uh, addition uh, with the expansion of NATO. And it would have been one step towards, I think, quelling some of these concerns. Uh, but uh, that ended, any such cooperation ended with the South second war in the Balkans, when once again, NATO was used to bomb Serbia over the conflict in Kosovo, a whole nother long and complicated issue in history there. After that, uh, the Russians just saw NATO as the enemy, plain and simple. And and it has continued to encroach on, the, on their borders. You know, I think there would have been, let me just answer it this way, <laughs> there would have been other ways to help secure the independence of the Baltic states without NATO. And I'm convinced that the main reason and rationale behind NATO's continued existence is uh, the boon to the military industrial complex. I already said that. And I, I think that's the main factor by far as to why we still have NATO. With regard to the, uh, before I get to the next question. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, with regard to uh, uh, the, the idea of, of Ukraine being in NATO, the, I, I think the reason that, or at least I'm reading that speculation, mm -hmm. that the reason um, that the West has not taken NATO off the table with respect to Ukraine is that it, it, by doing so, they would be viewed as allowing Russia to determine who can be a member of NATO and who can right. not. Which is certainly true, and I get that. But again, to me, it's a fundamental question of whether NATO should, should even be here right now. <laughs> right? I do see that point, absolutely. Why should we let Russia dictate? But NATO's existence has excluded Russia and made them see themselves as not outside of the sphere of the West and as the West big enemy. And moreover, they see NATO and have seen NATO all along as their boogeyman. It's their ultimate boogeyman that has helped to fuel their in military industrial complex. It works on both sides, right? So yeah, but you're absolutely right about the, uh, determining, not letting them determine, you know, the state of uh, uh, situation necessarily. Uh, the next, uh, Margaret X, I don't have a last name, uh, says there's a small piece of Russia east of Ukraine, which I presume is a reference to Kaliningrad. How yeah. Did that, how did that happen? Uh, that stems back to the many years of the partitions uh, uh, in the late 18th century, and uh, Russia determined to actually. Uh, Mr. Andrews alluded to that with uh, the point about the major naval base there. Once Russia had that sort of foothold early on, they'd established that naval base. And then for that reason, because of strategic importance, we're determined to keep it. So Russia has determined to maintain control of that little slither uh, to the east of the Baltics, really, and, and of Ukraine, for that matter, uh, mainly for its strategic reasons, despite all the geographic changes ever since. 
Uh, then we have a question from Judith Pulley. Mm -hmm. Putin constantly refers to the Nazis in control of Ukraine. How does he define <laughs> Nazis? Does he really believe this? Or is this just propaganda? Did he really think that Ukrainians would welcome Russian troops as liberators? Apparently, the troops were led to believe that. Right, right. Well, this whole thing about Nazis and, and who is a Nazi, and it's very interesting to watch the discourse on both sides of that, because uh, the Russians call the Ukrainians Nazis, and now the Ru Ukrainians call the Russian Nazis, right? <laughs> the Russians Nazis. So, I, you know, how does he define Nazis? Good question. I mean, he does emphasize in all of these uh, talks that he gives the anti-Semitic past of Ukraine, and there is some legitimacy in that, as I underscored, as there is in the case of Russia, too, right, and elsewhere. In fact, in my own work, I do a chapter on uh, the collaboration the col uh, collaboration with Nazi Germany in, the, in Rostov area in the southern part of, of Russia. There was a very strong part, aspect of collaboration and anti-Semitism in the that part of the Soviet Union, and that that was Russia. That is Russia, still is. So yes, uh, you know, how does he define Nazi? That's a good question. I think it's anybody who goes against his uh, you know, vision at this point must be a Nazi. I, I really am not sure. Does he really believe this, or is it just propaganda? Yeah, again, it's so hard to turn, determine that sort of question. I mean, it it's, it is propaganda, so let's just leave it at that, right? Does he really believe it or not? I, I honestly don't know. You know, it really goes back here to uh, this bit of an uh, sidebar, if you will, but back in uh, 2014, in some specs, this had impact in our own country and that Russia's involvement in the 2016 elections here. You know, uh, he hates Hillary Clinton despises Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and one of the main reasons that he so despises Hillary Clinton is because when Russia seized Crimea in this conflict back in 2014, she at that point publicly referred to him as being like Hitler, being like Nazi Germany and Hitler. Because of course, this is right out of the playbook of Hitler right? Oh, there's a Russian-speaking, as Hitler would have said, German-speaking group in the Sudetenland, right? So we must take it for Germany. In this case, Russian-speaking group in uh, my uh, majority in Crimea, so we should take it. She made that analogy, and that, that became then in the Russian media, which I pay attention to as much as I can, constant reproaches to to Hillary Clinton and just absolute uh, she was enemy number one at that point for daring to say that she had she had was no longer secretary of state and she was not yet running for office as president so she's in that sort of window in between but that public statement really upset uh, Putin which makes me think to some degree he probably does believe these things that 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 he's saying including quite possibly believing that Ukrainians would, would uh, welcome Russians as liberators. You know, again, it's, it's hard to say. I think they believed, certainly the Russians, that it would be easy, that their takeover of Ukraine would be easy. And maybe one reason they thought it would be easy is precisely that. I will draw a lot of analogies and have drawn a lot of analogies with the conflict, the last Soviet war in Afghanistan which is similar in a lot of ways to what we see developing right now. I'm working on the uh, book on that subject at the moment. And certainly the Soviets, first of all, they thought it would be a quick and easy victory, wound up lasting them about 10 years and they lost right, before withdrawing uh, and then collapsing in effect. Uh, they thought it would be a quick and easy victory and they absolutely also thought that they would be welcomed as liberators by the Afghans. Guess what? They were not. <laughs> they faced a tremendously stiff resistance. I think we're seeing a similar scenario unfold here. They're not going to be welcomed as liberators. They are going to face a stiff resistance uh, from the Ukrainians. They already are, right? And the troop, the Russian troops themselves seem to be now realizing some of the realities they got themselves into. I don't know yeah. if I necessarily answered that particularly well, but those are the things that come to mind, at least. I, I think you did. Uh, the next is from Jim Foster. Who, what do you think of the theory that the NATO threat and floats was really a pretext to Russian expansionist conquest of Ukraine and subsequently possible conquest of the Baltics? Yeah. All to restore the glory of the Soviet Empire. 
Yeah. And here I will, to some degree, maybe even contradict what I said earlier, because I, while I, and I'm going to stand by this, right? I absolutely do not think that NATO is, should be, she should even still exist. I will, I've been saying that since the 90s. I'm standing by that. <laughs> However, to me, that was secondary. NATO was secondary. It was absolutely a pretext. Now, I will say that Putin certainly did not want to see NATO um, come into Ukraine. But again, I, like I was saying to Mr. Andrews, I think that was a very unlikely scenario. However, I agree with the premise of the question here from Mr. Foster that uh, indeed uh, that was as much as anything else, a pretext for his decision to to uh, invade. There's an interesting, if, you, if you'll bear with me on this, uh, pattern in Russian history that I've been telling my students for years. Russian history has mostly been expansionist. Again, it's a massive country, right? Over large, long periods of uh, time, Russia has mostly expanded. But the, that period, those periods of expansion have been punctuated by moments of crisis and collapse. One could point certainly the time of troubles, as the Russians called it, in the early 1600s, in which Moscow wound up being occupied for a while by the Poles, the Napoleonic period for a while, in which Moscow was occupied by Napoleon, the, the revolutions of 1917, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire, obviously the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in the early 90s. But after each of those moments of collapse, what we have seen is a reconsolidation and re-expansion. And interestingly, indeed, that pattern seems to be holding again now in the post-Soviet Putin period. We had the interventions into Georgia and basically Russian control of Abkhazia and um, Ossetia, to North Ossetia in particular, two areas of Georgia that were kind of taken, not formally, officially under Russian control, but nominally under Russian control in the aftermath of that uh, intervention in 08. And then I think we're seeing this uh, yet again. So to some extent, absolutely, you know, Putin has publicly and repeatedly said that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yep. Uh, so him trying to restore that, you know, I think we're possibly seeing the early signs of that uh, happening, without a doubt. Uh, we now have a uh, question from Francis Lethem. Uh, why did the U.S. not encourage Ukraine to accept that they should be neutral between Russia and Europe? That and that is a very, very good uh, question and one that I'm not in a position to answer other than, I mean, there are different ways of looking at that, right? To some extent, uh, you have to wonder the U.S. motivation in this uh, for not for not taking, if I may, I'm par I might be twisting your question a little bit here, uh, Francis, be becoming neutral to me, meaning taking NATO membership off the table. Why not encourage that? Why not, in fact, even insist upon that, frankly, in the, in the name of peace, right? If that would have, you know, uh, been all it took, and I don't know if it would have been all it took to keep uh, uh, Putin at bay, again, probably not, given <laughs> that he does seem to determine to retake aspects of the old uh, Soviet empire, but at least you would have made that effort, that major diplomatic move to possibly bring an end to this before it even began. Why did the U.S. not do so? I'm not sure. They should have, in my opinion. U.S. and NATO more broadly, as I say, the possibility of Ukrainian membership was quite slim anyway because of primarily German and French opposition to it. So why not just acknowledge that? I honestly do not know. And uh, uh, do you have comments on the dangerous role of CNN? and biasing U.S. public opinion. Uh, the role of the U.S. media in times of war is problematic, be it CNN or any of the others, quite frankly, very problematic. Uh, you know, the one time I think you have to really, I'm not going to call it fake news, <laughs> because that's uh, such a troubling term, but uh, you, ha you have to always take the media critically, always, right? Uh, but especially during times of war. And I would say that's all of the main, you know, all of the media, frankly. The next question I think is a very interesting one from yeah. Pam Rademacher. Uh, 
how does how does Putin pull out or can Putin pull out and still save face? Yeah, the I think he's got to get this is where, and by the way, Zelensky yesterday for the first time mentioned the concession of taking NATO NATO membership off the board. Uh, and that off the table, right? And so that would be the maybe the thing that Putin could cling to as a victory and get his troops out of there. Maybe that's still the answer. I think that's a huge part of it, at least, uh, because, man, I'm sure he thought by now he would have, you know, a pro-Russian puppet government in power in Ukraine. And that that has not happened, right? I did not know, Robert. Uh, Bob, thanks for telling me about the uh, firing of the generals. That speaks volumes right now. That says a great deal with regard to how things are going. It's not going well for the Russian army. And I'm, I'm, my fear is that it will cause Putin to, to double down, dig in deeper, right? And just bring more force. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the one way I see out is uh, to take NATO off the table right now. And that um, was offered by our that appeared to be offered by Zelensky yesterday. Let's hope there's some follow-up on that. Okay, um, I'm going to jump to the uh, jump of, to Gordon Battle. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very important question. Mm -hmm. Why will we not give Ukraine airplanes when we provide all other kinds of weapons? Right. I saw that uh, again. Very good question. I saw some of re re reports about that. Um, not exactly sure why the U.S. is drawing the line there. They seem to be on uh, supplying. What what seems to be the strategy right now is to give planes and things of that nature to Poland, maybe Romania, NATO members, for them to then provide to Ukraine. I suspect just to keep the U.S. level of involvement sort of at you know relative minimum. Because what we clearly do not want is this uh, conflict to spread, obviously. This was another issue, an underlying factor, by the way, with regard to, and again, I'll draw the analogy here with the Soviet-Afghan war. For years there, uh, um, the, um, the United States supplied weapons to the Mujahideen rebels fighting against the Soviet troops, not directly, although there were calls for that to happen, but indirectly through Pakistan because they wanted to keep the U.S. role, which was, you know, obvious to all, at a relative minimum for fear that, frankly, it could lead to World War III, right? <laughs> Ultimately, that was the fear, and I think we're facing that now here. And, of course, Putin has been, to me, the scariest aspects of this has been him at one point putting his nuclear uh, arsenal on alert. And one of the things uh, he said, I wish I could remember the exact words now or the translation that... He said in that speech he gave just prior to the in, in, uh, invasion, he said, uh, any country that interferes in Ukraine will face historical consequences never before seen or something like that. I don't exact, remember exactly how he worded it now, but the underlying implication of that was, to me, I read it as a nuclear threat, right? Uh, and then him uh, after that, in the midst of the invasion, putting his arsenal on on alert. I mean, this this is worrisome to put it mildly. So I think the U.S. is being overly cautious, and we don't want to spark World War III, and we definitely don't want to spark a, a nuclear World War III, right? So the scary part of what the Putin said was, how does he define interferes? <laughs> what does it mean to interfere? The U.S. has clearly been providing weapons of various sorts to the Ukrainians prior to this, as well as ongoing. Is that interfering? That would certainly seem to be interfering. So I, I would read it all within that broad context. Can't give you a particularly uh, precise answer, uh, Gordon, but it seems to be a scenario not, not unlike Afghanistan, where we're going to try to provide Ukraine with some of the things it needs indirectly. One of the final point on this, one of the other uh, reasons given by the by the U.S., that is the Biden administration for not giving more planes directly to the Ukrainians was that uh, it would have minimal, minimal impact. Right. The, the return on that would be, you know, fairly minimal. But I, I think the main concern is not wanting to expand the war. I think that uh, uh, on that on that subject. 
as you alluded to, we've been providing stinger missiles to to Ukraine as exactly. we did to, yeah. as we did in the Afghan war. Exactly. They were very effective in shooting down planes. So if you can yeah. give them stingers to shoot down planes, why can't you give them planes to shoot down planes? Right. I think it's a more direct uh, involvement, and in, and in also as I understand it, to really make the aerial uh, effort uh, fruitful, you really should be taking out anti-aircraft bases. Yeah, yeah. And that's where you get a significant involvement in escalation. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and there's been calls, of course, for NATO or the U.S. to impose a no-fly zone. Zelensky himself has called for that several times. That would be, of course, prelude to World War III, almost certainly, right? So, I mean, I think the Biden administration has been overly cautious. And frankly, uh, the question here simply is, do we, the United States, and more broadly NATO, want to go to war with Russia over Ukraine? I don't think that we do. Maybe as we continue to see humanita the humanitarian effect, this will change. But uh, you are talking about you know, a major, major world war conflict, whatever you want to call it there. And we have to be, I think, cautious for sure. Um, the question is asked by Carol Coyle, even if Ukraine remains, will it be able to recover economically mm -hmm. from the devastation? Uh, I, I will interject, yes, over yeah. decades. <laughs> over decades, yeah, yeah, again, my, uh, one of my areas of uh, study was post-World War II reconstruction. And, you know, Russia was absolutely devastated at the end, Soviet Union, I should say, including Ukraine, absolutely devastated at the end of World War II. It took definitely a decade, really into the early 60s, to, to rebuild what had been destroyed during World War II. We're seeing, of course, a tremendous amount of devastation. I, I would think depending on how this thing plays out, that uh, if uh, Zelensky is able to remain in power, that would be a major defeat for Russia in and of itself, no matter how they call it, right, on their side. I, I would think you're going to see Western uh, countries, investors go in in huge numbers to help rebuild. And conversely, if Putin gets what clearly is the main goal, which is regime change, an overthrow of Zelensky and the return of a pro-Russian puppet government, then I think you're going to see the Russians come in with massive investment to, to, to rebuild the devastation that, that they've done, that, they, that they've mostly been responsible for. So, uh, it, yeah, it's going to take years. It's going to take a long time for sure. And it's going to take it a lot. Can of Russia afford to come in with massive investment? Yeah. Russia's in great poor shape economically. Economically, Russia is, is and, and I would, you know, this is not one of the questions here, but I would say that uh, uh, one of the factors driving Putin to do this all along has been uh, the devastating, the just terrible economic situation in Russia itself and trying to divert attention to the corruption. You know, his, his main political opponent, Alexander Navalny, who is now languishing in a Russian prison, of course, released about a year ago, as a matter of fact, it was in February of uh, uh, 2021, he released a very lengthy video on YouTube that most, I mean, it was widely viewed in Russia about the so-called Putin palace. You can see reports on it on, on YouTube, by the way, yes. if you're interested. I don't know if others, if folks already saw it, but they're calling it the New Versailles. It's this massive palace that Putin has built actually near Ukraine, interestingly, on the Black Sea in the southern part of Russia. That includes its own ice a hockey rink and uh, just <laughs> you name it. It's in, it's part of the Putin palace. And of course, it was built with taxpayer money and, and just the corruption is profound. Russians have, I think, to a large degree. Well, Russian society, I don't want to make over generalizations, is very divided. You have a lot of Russians of a nationalistic bent who, to the point that was raised earlier, do want to re return, want to return to the old glory days of the Soviet empire, without a doubt. Uh, so you have that element, and that's the element Putin is playing to, the Russian nationalists. They want to, 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 to paraphrase, make Russia great again. Right? And, and that's definitely part of this. Uh, but then you have an awful lot of Russians, too, who have seen, the, beginning increasingly to see the negative aspects of Putin's rule. 
the political uh, uh, crackdowns, to put it mildly, and the economic devastation and the corruption. So you have a very divided society in Russia right now. The fact that this war is is not going well does not speak well for, for Putin at all. Yeah. Jeff, we have uh, several uh, questions and comments remaining, but I think we're going to have to shortcut things because we've had you on for quite a while. But there is one uh, that I think is most pertinent, and that's from Rick Russell. Mm -hmm. um, What's your take on bio labs in Ukraine with, with US government funding or oversight? Victoria Newland seemed to reveal some cards that perhaps should not have been revealed the other day <laughs> in answering the question asked by Senator Rubio. Yeah, uh, that is a very good question as well, Rick. <laughs> right? uh, I really am not as, you know, uh, I was blown away, I think, by, as a lot of people were by, by that uh, exchange. And I'm not exactly sure, you know, what's what's going on there. Of course, Ukraine has been in the midst of American politics now for what several several years, right? With the uh, impeachment uh, proceedings, etc., and uh, uh, going back again to the 2014 period, if not before, Victoria Nuland has played a very hands-on role, to put it mildly. And I agree with you that she perhaps re revealed a few cards that uh, she shouldn't have in that in that dialogue. Uh, it, it took me by surprise, to be honest, Rick, and, I, and I'm not really, I don't really know how to address it because I don't have any further info than what was revealed in that, uh, in that news clip about, the, about that uh, uh, dialogue. So I'm going to punt on that one. <laughs> okay. With apologies. Jeff, um, I hope your group in Greensboro has enjoyed your presentation as much as I'm sure we at Meadows have, and I want to thank you very much. No, thank you, Bob. Thanks, everyone, and the Greensboro crowd, as well as Carolina Meadows folks. Thank you all very much.